Economics Part 1. Let's begin with the definition of an economic system. An economic system is the structure in which resources are turned into goods and services to address unlimited needs and wants. An economic system is how a nation or state allocates its resources in society as well as how goods and services are produced and exchanged. The four types of economic systems are a traditional economy, a command economy, a market economy, and a mixed economy. Let's start with the traditional economy. A traditional economy is a system in which economic decisions are based on the society's values, culture, and customs. All economic decisions are influenced by the society's culture and customs. This type of economy exists today in mostly underdeveloped countries or nations governed by strong cultural, religious, or tribal leadership. A traditional economy promotes cooperation and harmonious relationships. They are characterized by the unity found between its members. However, traditional economies often struggle with change and adaptation. They may continue to do certain things as their ancestors did, even though there may be a more efficient and cost-effective way. A command economy is a system in which a central authority, usually the government, controls economic activities. The central authority decides who will produce what, how much will be produced, and will set the prices. A command economy is usually found in socialist and communist forms of government. This type of economy is great at mobilizing economic resources quickly, effectively, and on a large scale. Individual self-interest is removed and the focus is on the general population in an effort to achieve a greater goal. However, the command economy forgets about other basic societal needs. Workers are told what jobs to do and how to do them. There is very little freedom in a command economy. As a result, shadow economies, also known as black markets, are often found inside of command economies. These black markets are created to meet the needs and wants of the society that the command economy isn't producing. Think back to the early 1900s and Prohibition. During this time, the United States outlawed the manufacturing, storage, transportation, and sale of alcohol. As a result, people began producing, selling, and transporting alcohol, quote-unquote, underground. Oftentimes, in a command economy, when a black market appears, the leadership of the central authority shifts its focus to shutting down these black markets and, as a result, negatively impacts, impacts the overall state of the economy. A market economy system is the exact opposite of a command economy. The market economy is the system in which privately owned businesses operate and compete for profits with limited government regulations or interference. This economy is often called a free enterprise or capitalism. Consumers and producers meet in the marketplace to exchange goods, services, and money. A market economy allows market forces to drive the economy. The government rarely intervenes with things like price fixing, quotas, and subsidizations. Considered the system of choice in today's economic conditions, this type of economy allows for free economic choice, competition, and uses profit as a motivator. Although ideal, this type of economy is not free from debate. The controversy with this type of system lies in its complete lack of government involvement. Many feel in order for an economic system to be successful, there must be some level of governmental interventions. Let's take a look at a brief video that will further explain a market economy. In a market economy, economic decisions and prices are determined by market forces rather than by central planning. Market forces refer to the collective effect of all the decisions made by individual participants in the economy, such as consumers and businesses, according to their free will. A market economy is considered the opposite of a planned economy, where a central authority, such as the government or military, controls major aspects of the economy. In reality, there are no pure market economies in the world, and few pure planned economies. Most countries, such as Western democracies, are mixed economies. This means they operate partly according to random market forces and partly according to centrally planned rules and decisions. While theory states that a pure market economy uses resources and labor most efficiently, in reality, democracies have additional goals besides efficiency. These may include minimum levels of safety, education, opportunity, or health.
To accomplish these goals, they introduced some centrally planned rules and regulations to guide the pure market forces. For example, the U.S. uses centrally planned forces such as food safety regulation, anti-discrimination laws, public education, and social security in order to distribute certain benefits more evenly than market forces would. Okay, so as the video states, there are very few market and command economies purely in existence. So what we end up having and what we have here in the United States is what's called a mixed economy. This is a combination of the market and command systems. A mixed economy may function through a marketplace, although the government or central authority regulates different aspects of the economy. The U.S. government is involved quite a bit with our economy. They set specific policies in an effort to cre create stability and prosperity. Our government makes tax and spending decisions in response to economic conditions. They control the money supply and regulate business activity to ensure fair business practices and to protect public well-being and safety. We will discuss these policies in greater detail at a later time. One of the main problems all economic systems try to solve is scarcity. This is the problem of unlimited needs and wants with limited resources. In economics, needs are goods and services that are necessary for an individual to live. Needs include things such as food, clothing, shelter, and health care. Wants are goods and services that are not necessary, but we still desire to have. For example, smartphones and iPads. Scarcity forces people, businesses, and governments to make decisions about how to allocate their limited resources. The concept of scarcity introduces something called opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the value of the alternative that you are giving up when you are making a choice. Let's watch a brief video explaining opportunity cost. The basic economic problem is the issue of scarcity. Because resources are scarce, but wants are unlimited, people must make choices. This lesson showcases the most important concept in macroeconomics, which is the concept of opportunity cost. Very simply, everyone has the same amount of hours in a day, but we all make different decisions about what we do, what we choose to buy, and how we spend our time. What determines these choices? Opportunity cost does. Every time you make a choice, there's a certain value you place on that choice. You might not know it or think about it, but every choice has a value to you. And when you choose one thing over another, you're saying to yourself, I value this more than another choice I had. Now, the opportunity cost of a choice is what you gave up to get it. If you have two choices, either an apple or an orange, and you choose the apple, then your opportunity cost is the orange you could have chosen, but didn't. You gave up the opportunity to take the orange in order to choose the apple. In this way, opportunity cost is the value of the opportunity lost. Value has two parts to it. It has benefits as well as costs. If you choose an apple over an orange, maybe the apple costs less, but maybe you enjoy it more. So looking at choice in terms of benefits and costs helps you make better economic decisions. To make a good economic decision, we want to choose the option with the greatest benefit to us, but the lowest cost. For example, if we graduate from college and suddenly we find ourselves in the job market, there are choices to be made. And let's say that two jobs become available to us. We can either work for company A or company B. Now, the job with company A promises to pay us $20 an hour, while company B offers to pay us only $10. Based on this information alone, of course, most people would choose company A. Why? Because they're paying a higher salary. When you look at this kind of a choice in only dollar terms, 
then you're only seeing it from the perspective of the benefits. Now, let's take that same example, but now we discover that the job for company A requires a fancy dress suit that will cost you $1,500. You realize that the job with the higher salary may not be worth it to you. Now you're starting to think economically. You're thinking economically when you look at the value of a choice through the eyes of the benefits and the costs. The next time you decide to buy something, think about the opportunity cost. This concludes part one of economics.